Welcome to our home. Thank you very much for attending. Um, this Shabbat, for my thoughts, you know, this Shabbat, the portion of Yisro will be read in synagogues all over the world. This portion contains the Ten Commandments, the Aseris Adivros, that God gave over to the children of Israel as they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. So, in my thoughts this week, I thought I would like to examine the two words that the Torah records as the nation's response to Moshe when he read to them from the Book of the Covenant. These words are found in the book of uh, Exodus, the second book of the Torah, in the portion of Mishpatim. Yes, it states, after Moshe presented the nation with the Book of the Covenant, they replied with the words, Nasa Venishma, we will do, and then we will obey which really means all that God will declare. Why were these words, Nasev and Nishma, so special to God? Now we read in the book of Devarim, in the last portion of this Torah, in Vezot HaBracha, the words that Vezorach me Seir, and he rose from Seir, and Hofia mehar Paron, and he shined from, forth from Mount Paron. Rashi says, based on a Sifri, that he, God Almighty, offered the Torah to the children of Asa, the inhabitants of Seir, so that they could accept that, so that they should accept the Torah, but they did not desire to do so. Rashi continues, then God went from there and offered the Torah to the children of Yishmoel, that they should accept it, but they too did not desire to do so. Now the Medrash Tanchuma asks, why are the descendants of Asa and Yishmoel singled out? After all, we are told that God offered the Torah to all the nations. He answers that we know that both Esau and Yishmael were the descendant from Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, and Yitzchak our father, and yet their progeny still did not want to accept the Torah. Now the Zohar teaches that both Esau and Yishmael are the spiritual progenitors of the original 70 nations of the world. When their descendants rejected the Torah, then all the other nations followed their example. Since evil traits of these nations distanced them from the Torah and holiness, God Almighty decided to bestow His holiness upon the children of Israel instead. From here we learn that if someone wants to attain Torah understanding, they must first eliminate their evil character traits. Again, this is based on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. So how are we to understand that God Almighty offered the Torah to all the nations of the world and, and that they all refused? And then it was not until he offered the Torah to the children of Israel that it was actually accepted. When they accepted his offer, they did so with the words, Nasev and Yishma, we will do, and then we will listen. That was when the Torah was officially brought down into this physical world. Now, the Sifri states that before God Almighty offered the Torah to the children of Israel, he first offered it to the children of Esau. They asked him what was written in it. Well, he replied to them with the sixth commandment, Lo Tirsak, do not commit murder. They said to God Almighty, you know that the essence of our father Esau was being a murderer, as the verse states, Hayodayim Yudei Esau that the hands are the hands of Esau. They said that was how he was blessed by his father Yitzchak, the al that by the sword you shall live. Killing is part of our DNA. It's our nature. The Sifri then continues. It states that God Almighty then went to the descendants of Ammon and Moab and asked them if they would accept the Torah. Well, they asked him what is written in it. He said to them the seventh commandment, Lotinov, do not commit adultery. They said to him, but that is our very essence. We were conceived in immorality, as it states in the portion of Bayero. That Lot's two daughters became pregnant from their father. That being the case, they said, we cannot accept the Torah. The Sifri that goes on to state that God Almighty then offers the Torah to the children of Yishmael. They too ask him what is written in it. 
God replied with the Eighth Commandment, Lo Tigno, do not steal. They said to God, all of our, ascend all of our ancestors were robbers, as it states in the portion of Lechlecha. There the angel tells Hagar that her son Yishmael will be a para, para Adam, a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him, meaning that he would be a highway robber. Based on our DNA, they said, we cannot accept the Torah. The Sifri states that God then offers his Torah to one nation after another, and no nation agrees to accept God and his Torah. No nation. No nation except for the children of Israel. When God approaches them with his request, would they accept the Torah? They didn't ask him what was written in it. They just replied with the words, Na'ase v'nishma, we will do, and then we will listen. Now, if you stop and think about it for a moment, how could the nations of the world refuse to accept the Torah based on their rejection of the commandments not to kill, not to be immoral, or, or not to steal? True, these prohibitions are written in the Ten Commandments. However, if you look, you'll find they're also found in the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noah the seven commandments that were given to the descendants of Noah after the flood. All of mankind are bound by these seven laws. So whether the nations of the world accepted the Torah or not, they were still culpable for acts of murder, immorality, and stealing. In addition, how did these character traits compare to the Jewish nation stating their allegiance to God and his Torah? So the question that God posed on the nations of the world was not, whether they would or were not transgress certain commandments. The real question that God was asking them was, will you change your nature for me? The nations of the world told God, no. They said to him, this was who their ancestors were, and this is who they are. They saw it as part of their DNA. They felt that in reality they couldn't change. When God approached the children of Israel with the same question, would they accept his Torah? They didn't inquire about his constant. Instead, they made a statement. They said to God Almighty that though we are by our very nature a people who are argumentative and questioning, what we call an am kashay oref, a stiff-necked people, but for you, we will go against our nature and accept your Torah, sight unseen. So the word nasa, we will do, meant that we accept upon ourselves to adhere to all that the Torah requires of us, no questions asked. And then, the nishma, we will listen, only then, after our unconditional acceptance of your Torah, will we commit ourselves to study and come to gain a greater understanding of all that is written therein. So the acceptance of the Torah on Mount Sinai was, in essence, a lifelong commitment by all the Jewish nation and their descendants, a promise to follow God and all of his commandments. Their decision was based only on the fact that he is our king and we owe him our allegiance. We view it as both an honor and a privilege to study all of his Torah and to observe all of his mitzvot, to be chosen by God Almighty as B'ni B'chori Yisrael, my firstborn child, Yisroel. And this is why, also why I believe that at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai is referred to as the marriage between God and the children of Israel. This is based on the word spoken by Moshe in the second verse in the portion of the Zot HaBracha, which states, Hashem mi Sinai ba, that he, God Almighty, came from Sinai. Rashi there states that he, God Almighty, went out to welcome them, the children of Israel, when they came to stand at the foot of the mountain. This is much like a groom who goes forward to greet his bride. Comparing God to a groom who is greeting his bride at the wedding canopy is very apropos. Why did God see the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai as a marriage of sorts? After all, marriage is a choice. You choose your spouse. You do not choose your father, nor do you choose your king. Since God Almighty created all of humanity, he is our Father and He is our King. Based on that fact, in reality we have no choice but to honor and respect Him. However, in reference to a Father or a King, love, 
Love is optional. Whether we love him or not is our choice. And this is why I believe that Rashi states that at the giving of the Torah on Sinai, that it was compared to a marriage ceremony. Honoring a king or a father is an obligation that we must observe. However, marriage is based on love. You see, we choose to love a spouse. We choose to bring a stranger into our lives. We choose to share our lives with them. That is the relationship that God Almighty desires to share with each and every one of us. He wants us to choose him. He wants our love. At the beginning of the Torah, God chose us. As we recite in the blessing before the reading of the Torah, for an aliyah. Asher bochar banu mikol ha'amim v'nosan lono is Torah so. Who has chosen us from all nations and has given us his Torah. Just like a, bro- a groom chooses his bride, so too did God Almighty choose us to be his bride and we accepted. The institution of marriage is in many ways similar to the acceptance of the Torah. Both marriage and religion are both predicated on the necessity for change. Though we are at our core spiritual beings, our bodies are corporeal, so though our souls may want spirituality, our bodies are drawn to the vanities and pleasures of the secular world. The struggle between these two conflicting approaches then becomes the challenge of our lives. So too in marriage. A-type personalities marry B-type personalities. Well, people will tell you that opposites attract. I've been married for 52 years, and I can testify that opposites do not attract. (laughs) After 52 years of happy marriage, uh, my wife made me add that, (laughs) we still see things very different. It is God, our Father in Heaven, who arranges for us to marry our Beshert, the life partner whom he has custom-made for us. Custom-made doesn't mean that husband and wife fit together like a glove. No. In fact, many times it may be just the opposite. If both spouses are identical, there would be a good chance that they both would become dogmatic. You would both agree on everything. Well, Sounds pretty good. But the problem is that there would exist little chance for either of you to grow. On the other hand, by being with someone who sees the world differently, you may come to the realization that there may be a different approach other than yours. Sometimes, your spouse's answer may even be better in dealing with a problem and or perceiving a situation. You now at least have the possibility to grow. That's what Torah and marriage are all about. Quote, not being an A or B personality, but blending the two together, taking from the best best assets that you both possess in the hope that you can both become a much better C. To be successful in marriage, one must put their spouse's needs first before their own. You do so by being a giver and not a taker. So too with our relationship with God, our Father in heaven. One's emphasis should be on serving him and not on serving yourself. Whenever you use the word I, your ego is taken over. We are told by our sages that we are to emulate God Almighty. As it states, And you shall go in his ways. Which means that just as God is charitable, so too should we be charitable. God is kind, and so too should we be kind. God buries the dead, and so, too, should we bury the dead. What I've always found strange, though, is that the first commandment that God gave to mankind, listed in the Torah, was to be fruitful and multiply, ergo, marriage. But if we are to emulate God, then shouldn't we be single, after all? God is single. This is a question that has bothered me for a long time. You know, by writing and thinking about this lecture, I found an answer. The reason why we need the Torah and the reason why we need to share our lives with a spouse are really very similar. It is due to the fact that we are all imperfect human beings. Both Torah and marriage encourage us to change, to overcome our addictions and pettiness, to grow, to be who we need to be, not necessarily who we are. One cannot succeed in religion, nor can they succeed in marriage 
without an active participation and or commitment. Both demand that we be players and not spectators in life. If we commit ourselves to trying to be the best that we can be in these two arenas, then we may come close to fulfilling what God our Father expected for us in this incarnation. So getting back to the question, why is God single? I believe that the answer is obvious from what I've said. Religion and marriage are all about change, but God is perfect in every way possible. And so he doesn't need to change or go. God is single. You know, the words, Nasev and Ishmael will do and I will listen, teach us an important fact. When is someone prone to listen to advice that you offer? When? When you do, Nasa, meaning when you personally have experienced the issue that you are advising another person about. Then, then they will listen. Theory and reality are not the same. Until you've actually experienced life and its challenges, your words are only spoken from your mouth, theory. As the saying goes, words from the heart go to the heart. Once you have personally felt a loss, then you have the ability to comfort and advise someone else who has or is experiencing a similar difficulty. There are those who have an issue with Jews being referred to as the chosen people. Based on this lecture, we can view this statement in a, in a totally different light. God chose us, but it was only after we chose him first. I would like to end this, my thought, with a gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew words Nasev and Ishma. We will do and we will listen. 891. This is the same gematria as the, as the numerical value of the Hebrew words Kalot HaNefesh an expiration of the soul, an expression used for a person who has died. This gematria connects with the Medrash that states that when the children of Israel stood at the foot of Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, they were able to hear the first two commandments that were given to them directly from God Almighty himself. With each commandment that they heard, they experienced kalot nefesh Their souls left their bodies. They died. God then had to resurrect them with the dew of the revival of the dead. After being resurrected twice, they asked Moshe to act as their intermediary. The awesomeness of the godly experience was more than overwhelming for their corporeal beings. 891 is also the same gematria in the miracle value as the Hebrew words, Kedusha Sayon, like the holiness of the day. Just as on the day of Shavuot, we celebrate the holiness of the day, the giving of the Holy Torah. So too marriage, which in Hebrew is called Kedushin. And even in English, it is also referred to as a state of holy matrimony. So we witness that on the day that God married the children of Israel, Shavuot, he gave them the most precious gift in his treasury as a wedding gift, his Torah. It was therefore seen as a time of great joy and unity for both God and the Jewish nation. Rashi states in the portion of Yisro that when God gave the Torah to the Jewish nation on Mount Sinai, they were ki'ish echot b'leib echot, like one person with one heart. Like one person with one heart. Well, these words were never more needed nor more precious than they are today. Let us hope and pray that we can all mend our broken fences and thereby come together once again in a spirit of harmony and joy. Let us do so by renewing our wedding, our marriage vows and our commitment to once again unite with God and his commandments with the words, Naase Vinishma. And with that, may we help to usher in the coming of Shia Tzakenu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending and... Uh, Again, it should be a good year, a special year. Again, we should repeat the words Nasim and Nisha this week. And God should uh, bring Mashiach. It's time. So we bless you again with happiness and health and safety. And again, thank you for attending. Shabbat Shalom.